But Romans chapter 10, it's a, again, familiar passage. It's one of the uh, prayers on our prayer sheet in the prayer room where the Apostle Paul expresses his longing and his desire where he says that it is his prayer to God that Israel will be saved. Now, what's interesting um, about that prayer and about that expression of desire is that of the uh, New Testament prayers, um, it really is the only one that is focused on the, in, uh, uh, the release of salvation for, for unbelievers to come to know the Lord. Now, the uh, context of Romans chapter 10 uh, comes in, you know, this, this unit of three chapters, which is normally known as Romans 9, 10, and 11. It's my opinion, actually, that the Israel, the conversation about Israel in the book of Romans actually really starts in Romans chapter 1, but that's a, a whole different subject for another day. But ordinarily, when we're thinking about Paul's instruction and teachings about Israel, it's those three chapters, and, and it's actually the most concentrated portion of the book of Romans where Paul talks about Israel. What he's doing in Romans chapter 9, and we're not, we're not going to cover all of Romans chapter 9, but what he's doing in Romans chapter 9 is he is stating that God is absolutely sovereign, powerful, and wise to have elected Abraham. God is sovereign, powerful, and wise to have elected uh, Abraham. And thus, in doing so, Israel, the people that came from Abraham, being the chosen people of God. But in chapter 10, what he highlights there is Israel's sin and rebellion. And thus, the cry for the salvation of the Lord to break in on the Jewish people. And so in chapter 9, he talks about their unique calling and sovereign election of the Jewish people. Chapter 10, roughly, he's talking about their rebellion and their sin, but yet Paul desires that they would be saved and he begins to talk about praying for the Lord to raise up messengers for how will they um, uh, know lest they hear and how will they hear unless uh, uh, someone is preached to them. And then in chapter 11, Paul begins to highlight that the Lord has every intention to bring restoration to Israel, bring them into the fullness of salvation, into the fullness of their calling, and that when they enter into their calling, which happens by the receiving of Jesus as their Jewish Messiah, the result is that the whole world is raised from death to life. So that's like a brief, quick overview of Romans 9, 10, and 11. But in the midst of that is this desire that Paul expresses his prayer for the salvation of Israel. Paragraph A in page 1, the scripture speaks of Israel as a unique people. Yet it is um, important to understand that their election is not because as a people on their own, there's nothing special about them. Now, they're special in the sense that they're created in the image of God like all humans. Uh, they're special in that sense that God loves humanity. But in terms of God's purpose 
and God's salvation, there's nothing intrinsically special about the Jewish people. And that's uh, very important to understand. As, as uh, one uh, uh, gentleman said, uh, the Dr. Carl Ellis, he says that their election was a matter of grace, not a matter of race. But yet, at the same time, there is a uniqueness of calling or a uniqueness of assignment, number one, and there is a uniqueness of identification. In other words, there's a uniqueness of assignment, what they're called to do, and there is a uniqueness of identity in terms of who they're called to be. The election of Israel was not because of anything that they are or that they have done. It was simply because God did. I remember uh, some years ago, um, you know, someone was praying. I was, in a, I was in a prayer meeting, and someone was praying so passionately. And, man, they were feeling it, man. They were just really going for it. And in their prayer, they said, Lord, said, what, what did you see in them that you would choose them? And I thought the answer is absolutely nothing. But that is the answer. Absolutely nothing. In Romans chapter 9, the apostle says this, because what Paul is doing in the first 11 verses of Romans chapter 9, he is laying forth this progression of God's election of Israel. He says, God called Abraham. He goes, and while, uh, while be before Isaac was in a womb, God spoke about Isaac. He goes, and then while Jacob was in the womb, God spoke about Jacob. And Paul says, the Lord did it this way, verse 11, so that the purpose of God would be according to election might stand not of works, but of him who calls. It was simply because that was God's wisdom, God's power, and God's sovereignty in electing Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses uh, 6 to 8, Moses uh, prophesies to Israel, and he says this, The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people. He goes, in fact, he goes, you were the least of all the people. Again, there wasn't anything intrinsic in you except that, verse 8, but because the Lord loves you. Because the Lord loves you. And I think that this is, again, this is a, a very important uh, thing to understand. This is important to understand uh, for Israel, and it is important to understand for the Gentiles that it ultimately is about God's sovereign, wise power, and it's about the reflection of, of his character and, 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 uh, and his nature. Again, the prophets declare it several times over and over. Ezekiel alone has mentions it at least 60 times that God's activity in and through Israel will serve to, for Israel to know who God is. And it will serve for the nations to know who God is. God is. Well, in Deuteronomy, paragraph B, Deuteronomy 32, verses 9 and, 9 and 10, this is an intense passage. It's talking about Jacob. In verse 10, it says, He, the Lord, found him. This is Jacob. He said, He found Jacob in a desert land in a wasteland, in a howling wilderness. So there's nothing fancy about the surroundings. And it says that God encircled him. God instructed him. And here it is. And he kept him as the apple 
of his eye. Talking about Jacob. So Jacob is kind of wandering around in the wilderness, and the Lord captures him. This is probably one of the most gloriously terrifying days where the uncreated God, the holy one, the perfect one, the zealous one, the righteous one, the pure one, he captures Jacob. He instructs him or he teaches him and he provides for him and he protects him or he keeps him as the apple of his eye. That phrase, the apple of his eye, uh, shows up about four times in, um, uh, in the Old Testament. It, it is an expression that means cherished. In other words, the Lord, he, I mean, think about it, I mean, he, he looked around and he saw Jacob and he got fixated in a divine and a holy way. He set his gaze on Jacob, on Israel. And he called him the apple of his eye, which literally means the little man of his eye. Jacob was the little man of his eye. It, it has this sense of a father who looks at a son and is just absolutely captured with affection. For his son. Cherished. The apple of his eye is a, a reference to uh, the pupil that we have in our eye. And I'm right here, I'm about to show how horrible I am at bi um, biology. And if you're a doctor, please don't, you know, send me emails, tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about, because I don't. But I was going to. Keep it real short and simple. The pupil, the apple of his eye is referring to the pupil. The pupil, uh, part of its purpose is to govern light. And secondly, when you look at the pupil, it can actually give insight into the state of someone's brain. And so I find it interesting that in Israel being called the apple of his eye, it is a statement of at least three things. Number one, it is a statement of God's uh, affection that they are treasured by him, number one. But number two, that they are actually called to be a reflection of light, that they are called to be a light to the nations, number one. And number two, that when looking at Israel, we can actually begin to get insight into what it is that God is up to. So what it is that God is thinking. It says in Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 15, that Israel is an object lesson to the nations. That they are, as it were, a, a virtual classroom. There's things to be known and learned and understood about God. I mean, think about it, that, you know, you know, Today, people, oh, they've done it for years, but, but, but with technology, it's getting more and more elaborate. You know, someone can have a book, and with the book, they have a study guide. With a study guide, they've got a couple of videos, they've got a couple of maps, and just to kind of make that book come more alive. Beloved, Israel, the, the, the territory of Israel is an entire classroom. It, it is an entire learning environment where we take the Word of God and and the things that are in the word of God that actually happened in time and space. And there's stories and there's uh, 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 all kinds of facts and events that took place. It, it, the, the entire uh, landscape in itself is a learning environment. It is a witness. We can know what God is thinking just by looking at what is happening um, in that nation, again, of course, according to the word of God. So paragraph C, so God placed uh, on Israel 
a uniqueness of calling and purpose. Now, this uniqueness of calling and purpose is not only related to things leading up to the first coming. And what I mean by that is oftentimes, because of replacement theology, where which is this view that says that the church has now replaced all the promises of Israel. And because of replacement theology, there is kind of like this thought process that's, that is totally okay with the Old Testament having a, a, a types and figures and shadows leading up to the first coming, but then after the first coming that the Lord has done with Israel as a natural entity in the Middle East. And that's not true. God has placed his calling, the uniqueness of calling and purpose um, on Israel, not only related to his first coming, but also related to uh, the end times in terms of the, the end time uh, 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 drama as well as the age to come. Right there on the notes, paragraph C, Romans chapter 3, verses 1 to 2, the apostle Paul, he, he asks this rhetorical question. And the question is this, what advantage then um, has the Jew? Of what profit is the circumcision? Talking again about the, the natural identity of the Jewish people. And Paul says in verse 2, he goes much in every way. That's tremendous advantage. But what is he referring to? He goes, well, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. In other words, they were entrusted with, uh, with the oracles, the prophecies, the covenants, the promises, the temple, the worship, uh, the moral code, the knowledge of God. I mean, Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 4, actually 1 to 6, gives another list of just details of things that were entrusted to them. Even the very writing of the scriptures that we have right here, this, this is a Jewish book. And so it's a significant advantage. Now, where people get confused is that the significance and the value and the importance and the advantage of being Jewish that alone, being Jewish, doesn't buy you anything before the throne. The way that you come before the throne is the way everyone comes before the throne, and it's through the born-again experience. But when it comes to assignment in the age to come, we'll talk about it in just a few moments, there is a very specific assignment that the Lord has for the nation of Israel in the age to come. Number one, and number two, the natural identity of being a Jew, even though it doesn't earn you anything as far as, as salvation is concerned, which Paul makes that point in Philippians chapter three. In Philippians chapter three, Paul says, he goes, man, he goes, I was a Pharisee, a Pharisee, Hebrew, Hebrew, circumcised the eighth day, all of this stuff. He goes, he goes I consider all of this stuff rubbish, but he's not considering it rubbish in terms of, and let me say it differently, Paul is not contradicting himself in Philippians 3 and in Romans chapter 3. In Philippians 3, he's talking about his righteousness as a man before the throne of God that can only be attained by faith through grace uh, and through the born-again experience. That is the thing that he's really highlighting. But as it pertains to the faithfulness of God, to his covenant, he goes, no, he goes, being Jews has tremendous advantages because it puts on display the faithfulness of God, that what God said is absolutely true and that he kept his word. So there's much advantage. The, there's, uh, 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 there's a uniqueness of calling on the Jewish people, number one. Number two, there's a uniqueness of purpose as it pertains to the end times. There are end time things that the Lord wants to do. And the prophet Daniel talks about it, Daniel chapter nine, he talks about the 70 weeks are determined for your people and the holy city. And then thirdly, there's a purpose in the age to come. Psalm 40, verses one and two. Great is the Lord 
and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in his holy mountain, the joy of the whole earth, the city of the great king, referring to Jerusalem in the age to come. In other passages, it's called the, uh, uh, the faithful city, also known as the city of truth. The exact opposite of the way the city is described in Revelation chapter 11, verse 8, where she's described as spiritually Edom, uh, excuse me, spiritually Egypt and Sodom. But the scripture makes it very clear that that is not how it's going to end. Jerusalem will be and is the city of the great king, and it will be the joy of the whole earth. Right now, uh, Jerusalem is the confusion of the whole earth in many, 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 many ways. You talk about Jerusalem, it's in the news, it just creates all kinds of confusion and it's mad, sad, glad and everything. And the scripture prophesies that Jerusalem will become the joy of the whole earth. And that's a vast subject in terms of how it becomes the joy of the whole earth. But one of the ways that it will become the joy of the whole earth is its history and then, and then the story of how God took that city and God put on display his faithfulness, his covenant faithfulness to the people. And we will talk about that story and we will learn that story and we will expound on that story and it will just fill our hearts with joy and gladness concerning the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and his leadership. Paragraph D. And so we have the uniqueness of calling and purpose in paragraph C. In paragraph D, we have that they are called to be a unique people. When the Lord delivered Israel out of Egypt, he called them and he said this. He goes, if you obey me, he goes, then you will be a unique people among all the nations. And in his uniqueness, he says, you know, he, he said, because I've set you apart. He says, holy nation, but it means I've set you apart to be a kingdom and priest. He goes, I've set you apart to be a priestly people. Because that is the assignment that I have for you if you were to obey me. We know that according to Deuteronomy 28, I don't have that one in the notes, but Deuteronomy 28, uh, verses uh, 12 to 13, the Lord says that, you, that he says that they will be the lead nation, that they would be the head and not the tail. In the age to come, if I can say it this way, under the leadership of Jesus Christ, Israel will be the, uh, it will be the world power. Right now there's talks about, you know, America being a world power, and, but other nations, you know, trying to, you know, send in applications for the job as well, and, and, <laughs> And so, so much of history is a struggle for world powers. And when we look at Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 7, we're not going to look at all the details, of course, but Daniel chapter 7, what we see is we see uh, four world powers. We see the, uh, the Babylonian uh, Empire. We see the Persian Empire. We see the... Uh, 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 the, the Greek Empire, and then we see the uh, the Antichrist Empire, the, the the fourth one there. And the next thing is you see the Son of Man. Well, the 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 vision of the Son of Man being given a kingdom is in contrast to those four empires that are highlighted in the Daniel chapter seven. In other words, there are four world powers. This world for a uh, world power number one. They get dethroned, world power number two. They get dethroned, world power number three. They get dethroned, world power number four. And that world power gets dethroned by the kingdom that's been entrusted to the Son of Man, and he will rule and reign from Zion, the earth forever. It's that great verse in Revelation eleven fifteen. 15. Now the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Jesus, the ruler of the whole world from Jerusalem. Jerusalem 
being the capital city, the joy of the whole earth forever. And it is a city as in uh, Psalm 48. It is a city, it is a priestly city. Therefore, it, God is great and he's greatly praised um, in that city. Of course, throughout the whole earth because of Malachi 1.11. Paragraph E. So we've got the uniqueness of calling and purpose, paragraph C. In uh, paragraph D, we have that they are a unique people. But in paragraph E, we have a unique affection from the Lord towards Israel. In Jeremiah 31, he says, yes, I have loved you, Israel. And I've loved you with an everlasting love. I mean, I mean that is so powerful. Again, the, the uncreated God, he, he set the fullness of his affections on Israel. I believe that it's the same love that Jesus declared in John 15, 9, when he, as a Jewish Messiah, stands in front of Jewish apostles and he says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. It is as it were, he comes in the flesh and he declares Jeremiah 31, 1, uh, 31 3 over them. He goes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Again, I believe it is that love that Jesus declared in John 15, 9. Now, Israel, however, can only enter into this, the experience of this affection through the born-again experience. It is in, and, and the reason why this is an important subject is because if we know that this is how God feels for Israel, in fact, you know, we've, we've been you know, praying these phrases, for those of you who've been tracking with John 13 to 17, you know, God, thank you for, show me more. Well, a prayer that we can pray is, Father, thank you for loving Israel in the same way that you love your son. Show me more. And the reason why I believe that asking the Lord to show us his affections for Israel is important is because when we have a heart for Israel, it is very important that it's not fueled by human sentiment, but rather it is fueled by having touched the Father's affection. We want to touch the Father's affections for Israel. Let's turn to page two. So we pray for Israel because God loves them. Page two, paragraph A. Israel's salvation and God's glory for the whole world. Again, the primary reason why the Lord established IHOP is to contend for Israel's end-time prophetic purpose. And I really believe that this season that we're in is, again, is about the Lord helping us, giving us skill to understand, understand more from his word, his heart uh, for uh, the Jewish people, and, and in doing so, we'll get more clarity about the nature of our assignment in terms of why the Lord um, birthed this movement. Our primary assignment is to pray for God's purposes um, in the nation of Israel, and so we're believing for an historic release of the Holy Spirit. Again, the IKC's mission is to be part of mobilizing or as we say, exist to partner in the Great Commission by advancing nine-day prayer. So part of our mission is to be a part of mobilizing global prayer, or the, the, the global prayer movement that will pray 24-7 for Israel to receive Jesus as their Messiah. And so that is, again, Romans 10.1, we're praying for her salvation. For the greatest revival as prophesied by the prophets 
the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and that they would come to encounter Yeshua. Jesus uh, promised that Israel would have an unusual end-time visitation of his presence when her leaders recognize Jesus as a true Messiah and deliverer. Now, right there in the notes, Isaiah 62, Isaiah 62, verses uh, 5 to 7, it says, As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so the Lord rejoices over you. He said, I have set watchmen on the wall. The prophet Zephaniah, it's right there in the notes as well, he jumps in and he adds that the way the Lord rejoices over Israel, he rejoices over her with singing. When I look at Isaiah 62, verse 5 and 6, he says, as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so the Lord rejoices over you, Israel. I have set watchmen on your walls, Jerusalem. The, the, the setting of the watchmen on the wall is part of the Lord's expression of rejoicing over Jerusalem. And one of the ways that he rejoices over Jerusalem is by singing through the watchmen. And so when we're talking about this, uh, the Lord raising up and establishing the dignity of the full-time occupational singer and musician, this is part of the thing that I believe is in the Lord's heart he says, he says, Israel, I am your bridegroom. I rejoice over you. And one of the ways that I'm going to show forth my, my rejoicing over you is you will see the emerging of at least a hundred million watchmen across the nations. And by my spirit in them, I will sing through them concerning who you are. And what you're about. That's not the only thing that's going on there in Zephaniah 3. Because I believe that when the Lord uh, appears and he comes into Jerusalem, he will literally lead in song. Very much so like his great, great, great grandfather, King David, who was known as the sweet psalmist of Israel. The ultimate sweet psalmist of Israel, Christ Jesus, will come and he will sing over his people. But between now and then, there's a significant singing, the rejoicing of the bridegroom, I believe, that will come through him singing through the watchman on the wall. The prophet Joel, paragraph C, he spoke of a release of great glory in the land of Israel that would result in the salvation of many. And the apostle Peter, he, uh, he, he quotes Joel at Pentecost because Pentecost was a down payment of what we're gonna see in full at the end of the age. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit that we saw in the book of Acts was just, a, was just a down payment of the full manifestation of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem, of course, throughout the whole land of Israel, um, as well uh, at the end of the age. Let's look at a couple of things. Let's go right to in a, a paragraph D. The end time release of the Spirit will happen in the context of a global movement of believers given to prayer and fasting interceding for Israel. And the intercession of the believers for Israel will result, uh, according to Joel chapter 2, at least in two, three things. Number one, it will result in a great outpouring. He said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, Israel, and your sons and your daughters, they will prophesy. And your young man will see visions. Your old man will dream dreams. And one of the things that we want to be crying out for in these three weeks is that the Lord would, uh, would in an increased way, begin changing the dream life in the land. 
I'll say this again. That we would begin, according to Joel, begin to ask the Lord to, in an increasing way, change the dream life in the land. He said, Lord, you promised. You said that you would release your spirit and that dreams would come and that visions would come and visitations would come. And, and these dreams and these visions, the vast majority, they will be about the proclamation of the glory and the beauty of Yeshua. But this global uh, uh, prayer movement that the Lord is continuing to develop and raise up will not only result in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Job 2, 28 to 29, it will also result in great shaking. Job chapter uh, 2, verses 30 to 31. The moon turning to blood, the sun dark, uh, fire being, uh, uh, being released, wonders in the heavens, signs on the earth. We see these actually manifest in, in the book of Revelation. And then thirdly, Salvation, Job chapter 2, verse 32, that in the midst of the outpouring of the Spirit, in the midst of the shaking, that before the Lord returns, many will call out on the name of the Lord, and they will be saved. Paragraph E, Israel's national repentance. And confession of Jesus as her Messiah is deeply connected to the second coming. Let's go to page three. Romans chapter 11, Paul talks about this plan, this divine strategy. He calls it the mystery and he says, you know, it's interesting, in chapter 10, verse 1, he goes, he goes, my desire is that Israel be saved. Okay? Romans chapter 11, he goes, my desire is that you not be ignorant. Because my desire is that you would be, that you would grow in understanding, Paul says, in the plan of God as it pertains to the salvation of the Jewish people. And one of the reasons why Paul says there's a plan is because in the natural, there are many things happening in Israel and around Israel that actually seem to go the opposite direction of salvation. And Paul says, he says, he says don't be tricked by this. He says they are blinded in part and it's, and it's only temporarily. He said, there is a plan, and this plan, Romans uh, eleven twenty six, 26, will culminate with all Israel getting saved. Let's go to paragraph B on page three. The, 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 instead of the mystery, you can say the plan of God for Israel was foundational for Paul and it actually fueled his uh, mission to the, uh, to the nations. In other words, it was Paul's understanding of the plan that energized him to preach the gospel to the nations in the hopes to provoke the Jewish people to jealousy. This is important. Paul was not driven by any sense of patriotism, or a earthbound concern. In other words, yes, Paul was a Jew. Paul was Israeli. In that way, he was a Roman citizen as well. And undoubtedly, Paul loved his country. But his countrymen, if you read the way his countrymen treated him, it, I don't care who you are, you will lose your motivation really quick. No, you got to be sustained by something completely different. And Paul was sustained by the understanding of the mystery. In fact, what's interesting is in Romans chapter 9, verse 1, Romans chapter 9, verse 1, it's that famous passage where Paul 
says, he's, he says, I wish that I could be accursed uh, uh, for the, it, it, if it meant that my brethren could be saved. Now, here's what's interesting is in Romans chapter 8, so just uh, 38 and 39, because it's Romans chapter 8, 38, 39, Romans 9, 1, okay? Say this again. Romans chapter 8, verse 38, 39, and Romans 9, 1. Paul ends Romans 8, and he says this. He says, I am convinced. He goes, I am utterly convinced that nothing can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. He says, I am in Christ, and as I am in Christ, as I am in union with Christ, he goes, I am experiencing the love of God. He goes, and I'm thoroughly convinced that nothing can separate me from his love that is found in Christ. And then in Romans 9, 1, he says, and I tell you the truth in Christ, I am not lying. He goes, the Holy Spirit is bearing witness. He goes, that I am perpetually grieved. In other words, the burden that Paul carried for Israel wasn't because he saw 10 documentaries on the Holocaust. He, he was fueled by a burden for Israel because he was in union with Christ, having experienced the affections of the Father and understanding God's divine plan for the Jewish people. And so that is the... The invitation for us, really for the next 5, 10, 20, whatever years, is to begin to say, Lord, thank you, Father. Thank you that you love Israel like you love your son. Show me more. We, the way forward in carrying God's heart for the Jewish people is by being touched by the affections of the Father. The understanding of, let's go to paragraph C, the, the understanding of the mystery, it, um, it connects us with the relevance of global missions. We begin to understand the Great Commission in the context of provoking Israel to jealousy and that that in itself brings the, uh, the, 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 the Great Commission in full. But here's what Paul says, I'll look at paragraph D, and then we'll end it with this. In paragraph D, Paul says that it is important that we not be ignorant of the mystery. He said, that's my desire. But he gives a caution, and the caution is this, lest we become wise in our own opinions. In other words, lest we be arrogant, lest we be prideful, lest we be opinionated and convinced of our own mindsets. He goes, no, we, we want to grow in understanding the plan, and the plan is right there in the Word of God. Now, here are some ways... I probably should have started with this, but anyway. Um, <laughs> here are some ways that we can be uh, wise in our own opinion when it, comes to the, uh, when it comes to the mystery. Number one, sentimentalizing Israel. Sentimentalizing Israel. In other words, wrongly interpreting their resistance to the gospel. Wrongly interpreting their resistance to the gospel. Number two, having an inordinate negativity towards Israel, where there's a lack of tenderness related to the Old Testament prophets and their narratives about Israel. There are a lot of very intense things that the prophets had to say about Israel, and to just grab those facts, and because they're true, and they're just running with them, that is part of the, the, uh, uh, the ignorance that Paul is warning against because we want to embrace these truths with, with tenderness and recognizing that there's real people involved. Thirdly, anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism ranging anywhere from anti-Judaism to, uh, to the evil desires and plans to annihilate um, uh, Israel as we see that in some nations in the world. Fourthly, replacement theology. The idea that the church has replaced, is uh, that the church has replaced natural Israel. But the fifth one, I would say probably is the biggest one. Indifference. Indifference. In other words, being comfortable with not understanding the Israel thing. 
Beloved, we don't want to be comfortable with not understanding the Israel thing. We, we want to lean in. The Apostle Paul told the church of Rome, he said, it's my desire that you not be ignorant. So the worship team come up. It's my desire that you not be ignorant. I want to end it with this. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1, the, uh, the prophet Habakkuk, he says this. He says, I will stand my watch. In other words, I will give myself to prayer. He goes, and I will set myself in a rampart. In other words, I will put myself in a place where I can begin to gain perspective. So basically, I'm going to give myself to prayer. I'm going to give myself to the word. And I will watch and see what he will say to me, what God will say to me, what he will show me, and what it is that I will say when I am corrected. This is a, this is a Jewish prophet recognizing that he needed an adjustment in his thinking as it pertains to God's plan for the nation of Israel. And that's what I believe part of what is happening in these next couple of weeks is the Lord is putting an invitation before us to, uh, to, to stand before him in prayer and to give ourselves to him in his word with perspective. Amen? All right, let's stand.